Hello, everyone. You reach S.J. Thomason and Joel Rodriguez with Christian-Apologist.com. And uh, welcome. We're really excited today because we have a very exciting guest. Uh, it's Dr. Gary Habermas, and he is a PhD, and he uh, is a professor of philosophy and theology, and he comes uh, with a PhD from Michigan State, so great scar Spartan school. <laughs> they go Spartans because I happen to be a Spartan as well. Oh, really? And, uh, okay. <laughs> That's our mascot. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually turn it over to Dr. Habermas if you'd like to share a little information about yourself. And then Joel has a few questions to ask and we'll go from there. Okay. What information would you like? Well, okay, how did you get uh, into just, apologetics? Yeah. Do you want to... How I got into it or? Yes. How did you get into, how did you choose your field? You said your, your dad was a a business professor, so and I'm a business professor, so I'm wondering how you decided to go into uh, theology instead. Well, a lot of times I do interviews, and and people say, uh, like at a radio program or something, and people say, uh, "Did you get into the resurrection because you want to help doubters?" And I said, and I'd say, "Well, I wished I could claim to be that altruistic, but that's not the way it happened." Um, I went through about. 10 years of doubt straight and then about oh 10 or 15 more years of doubt after the first 10 so i played a lot of sports uh mostly like football and hockey and stuff and and when i would come in at night i would go immediately to my doubts and to my questions and i had tried a lot of fields is Christianity true? Well, try this, try that, try this. And I didn't think any of them to speak of had great answers. So I settled on the resurrection, and I realized from the beginning that if the resurrection were true, it could support the weight of all my questions. But, of course, the resurrection had to be true. So that launched me into a very long study of the resurrection. And uh, so that's how I got into it. I started studying the resurrection. And then a short time later, well, a short time, maybe uh, 10 years later, I started studying near-death experiences because I saw that as another potential area where NDEs don't say Christianity is true, but they would argue that religion is true of some sort. And naturalism would be false if NDEs are true, most likely. So anyway, those that was the one-two punch. Um, resurrection first and near-death experience is second. And I got into another topic or two. I got interested in the Shroud of Turin and ended up writing a couple books later with a co-author who was one of the, he was a professor at the Air Force Academy and um, Ken Stevenson. And he was in the famous 1978 testing in Turin. So the Shroud and a few other things came up. Reliability of the New Testament. Uh, that's about it. I didn't think there were very many evidences that were truly you know, real likely. So those are the main fields I looked at. Reliability of the New Testament, Shroud of Turin, near-death experiences, and the resurrection of Jesus. Wonderful. This is going to be exciting, Joel. Yeah. Wanna... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a question I would like to ask you is sometimes you have certain Christians, you know, who would say, well, I know that the Bible is true. I know that the resurrection happened. I know that, uh, you know, naturalism is false and so on and so forth. I don't need apologetics. I don't, I don't need any you know, of those arguments. What would you say to those people? That say what? Did they accept that they accept all that? They uh, so many Christians would say, "Well, I know that the resurrection is true because the Bible says so, right?" Uh, and I know that uh, naturalism is false because the Bible says that. Right. Sure. And, and and they would say, "Well, I'm not interested in arguments or or you know uh, anything about apologetics." What would you say to those people? Why is it important for us as Christians to actually delve into this kind of stuff? Well, I interestingly enough, I just finished teaching a PhD course like yesterday, and as the course uh, was ending, one of the PhD students asked a question very similar to that, and 
and I ask, I, I mean, I said to them, if, you, if that's another way to ask me, why is apologetics important? If that's what you're asking, I would say apologetics does two or three things. But one thing apologetics does is to quote my good friend, uh, Greg Kokel, it puts a stone in people's shoes. In other words, it gives naturalists something to think about. And so one reason I would do apologetics is to teach the truth of Christianity to those who don't believe. The second reason <clears throat> I would be interested to do apologetics is because if all apologetics does is help unbelievers, uh, or in this second case, believers, if all it does is help believers, it's worth its weight in gold because we have a lot of believe unbelievers and then we have a lot of believers who doubt. Actually, they both doubt. I get, I get dozens, it may probably three, four emails a week, from sort of like a help, help, I'm doubting type email, and maybe three of them are from believers and ones from an unbeliever. So, unbelievers answer those questions, ask those questions too. So, I think the second thing apologetics does is it helps people and answers questions whether the person wants to become a Christian or not. So both to challenge the unbeliever and to build up the believer, I think those are the two major reasons for the strength and worthfulness of apologetics. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are the guy who has studied the topic. There are so many topics, you know, that we can get into and we can study, but you have studied the topic, which is the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I want you to give me uh, the strongest evidence we have as Christians for the resurrection. Well, if I had to pick just one, I would pick that the disciples had experiences after the death of Jesus that they believed were post-resurrection appearances. They believe that the critical community, critics, they got to be a specialist in the area. I'm not talking about somebody who teaches English and doesn't believe. If you're, if you're a critic in the area, in a relevant area, you're going to concede that the disciples had these experiences. Uh, virtually everybody does. Now the question is going to be, what do you do with the data for the disciples having the experiences if the naturalistic theories don't work? Now what do you do? And today, it's there's been a trend away from natu uh, naturalistic options, away from alternative theories. And so if you're turning away from alternative theories and yet you believe the disciples had an experience, what are you going to do with that? But I mean, over that's just the one I would pick. But overall, I would say the best thing I would want to do with them would be to, I would use what I call the minimal facts argument. Uh -huh. And I would say, uh, it depends on what mood I'm in. I mean, I use anywhere from three to seven evidences when I'm doing this. But if I would do just, just say a half dozen, six of them, I would pick six facts that are conceded by the vast majority of every critic who, who knows the area, critical scholar. And I would say, now here's six areas that evidence the resurrection. What are you going to do with these? And if they try to pick a naturalistic theory, I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, they're going to be in trouble. Um, if they don't pick a naturalistic theory, then what are you going to do with it? So that's the dilemma. That's the catch twenty two. I think that that naturalists are in when they try to when they try to go after the resurrection. Can I can I ask you a question on that? What sure. what do you think about? Because actually, I've used your your uh, your strategy when I've debated a couple of atheists on YouTube, and so right. I love the minimal effects. Um, but one of the atheists mentioned something about the empty tomb, and that. Um, and that you changed your views on the empty tomb as far as scholarly consensus. Can you speak to that? I haven't changed my view at all. I, what, what, what point was the atheist trying to make? Well, how, did, how did the atheist say I changed my view? He said that you no longer said it was scholarly consensus. And so I'm wondering if you did say that or if I missed something. Uh, okay, he's wrong. But let me, let me clarify what I mean by scholarly consensus. I don't, if I were to pick six minimal facts, the empty tomb wouldn't be one of them, but they'd never have been one of them. I've never included the, the empty tomb and the minimal facts. Um, now, there's actually more evidences for the empty tomb 
than there is if you just do a head count. There's more reasons to believe the empty tomb than there is to believe any of the other six. You say, well, then why don't you kick it up there in the category with the minimal facts? But the reason I don't is because the second reason that qualifies for the minimal facts is that uh, the great majority, I mean like 90 some percent of critics will grant it. And they don't grant the empty tomb that much. The, the acceptance rate on the empty tomb and my study, with about 4,000 sources now, is about 70 to 75 percent accept it. So I don't, I don't count the empty tomb as one of the six. But in that book you referred to earlier, um, the case for the resurrection of Jesus, and we use four minimal facts there, and we use still use the empty tomb. We called it four plus one. We, we use the plus one for the empty tomb without calling it a minimal fact. Uh, I would do the same thing today. I would use uh, six facts for the minimal facts plus one. I would use the empty tomb. The only reason I don't use it is because not that not that high a percentage of scholars accept it. It's quote unquote only seventy five, which I think is pretty good for critical scholars. But all the other ones are up in the nineties. So uh, I would say six plus one. But I haven't changed my view. I don't know what the the critic was talking about. Um, it's since I started this, it's always been the empty tomb has always been in the two thirds to three quarters percentile category. So 68 to 75 percent. That number varies a little bit over the years, but I've never called the empty tomb one of the minimal facts. Never have. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, uh, just to clarify something here, uh, because your study was done, I think it was in the 80s uh, when, when you did the, uh, the, the studies on the uh, empty tomb, I think. So what happens is you're taking, when it comes to the minimal facts, the facts that are agreed upon, let's say virtually, you're talking about universal facts. Let's say the disciples had experiences. That's a universal fact. The disciples, that no, the disciples had experiences. Yeah, critics, that's universal. Critics, critics won't grant that there are appearances. You said appearances a second ago. Um, the disciples had experiences, experiences that they yeah. believed were appearances, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, exactly. Uh, that, that's what I, I was trying to say. That's right. The, disciple, mm -hmm, the disciples had uh, experiences. Right. That is a universal fact. Paul yeah. wrote, yeah, yeah, let's say Paul wrote uh, Galatians. That's universal. Nobody's going to uh, dispute that. When it comes to the empty tomb, the vast majority of scholars agree on that. The only thing is, is not a universal fact. Would That's it be right. a, a, yeah, it's not universal because right. some people are going to dispute it. Right. But the vast majority believe that. It's like, let's say, Second Thessalonians, the vast majority of scholars agree that Paul wrote Second Thessalonians, but at the same time, is not included in what they call the undisputed Pauline epistles. Which there are seven. Right. Yeah. And then second Thessalonians is not one of them. You're right. First Thessalonians, mm -hmm. but not second. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah. So right. He, right. you're yeah, you're doing the exact same thing here. Uh so and I you and when you do the uh, minimal facts approach, right. I also believe that you, you limit yourself to just those seven letters of Paul as well. I do. Yep. I yeah, do that, because, that, because that's my belief. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to do a minimal facts argument, I am bound to what critical scholars allow. So I can only use their material, right? Yeah, exactly. You probably believe that Paul wrote the uh, 13 letters. But, you know, for the sake of uh, uh, doing this, you're only going to stick to seven. I will only use seven on. when I do the minimal facts, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to ask you a question. And you have uh, uh, written some books on this. And that is the Strat of Turin. Can you tell us about that? To the person who doesn't know anything about this and doesn't know the arguments or anything like that, can you tell us what this is? Can I tell you what what is? The Strat of Turin. Oh, yeah, I missed that uh, when you asked that. Um, the Shroud of Turin is a burial garment that's a little over 14 feet long. It's a little over... Um, uh, three, it's about three and a half feet wide, and it, it was buried lengthwise 
I'll tell you what, I'll hold up a pen here. And if this is the human body, the shroud was buried this way. So that if you, when the shroud opens up, the body falls out and the two heads, because there's a front image and a back image, the front of the head and the back are in the middle and the top of the feet and the bottom of the feet are at the far ends of the cloth. And the man buried in the shroud has very obviously been crucified. Um, he's got whipping marks all over his body. He's got scalp marks from something up here in his head. He's got wounds in the two wrists. He's got wounds in the two feet. And he's got a large wound in his upper right side that has a lot of blood coming down. And then apparently maybe they moved the dead body. Who knows? But the blood flips around to the back and goes across the belt line uh, at, on the bottom of the back, the back of the shroud. And the question is, who's the crucified man? And is it real blood? And how in the world did the image get on the cloth? What's, what's the image made out of? Because there are hundreds of burial garments in existence today, and none of them have images. I mean, there are hundreds. They might have blood stains. They do have blood stains. They have stains of decomposition on the burial garments, but they don't have an image, a body image. So how does the body image come on the cloth? And if it's Jesus, and a good friend of mine, uh, Bob Rucker, has an, uh, an essay he wrote. He's a, he's a retired uh, nuclear engineer, and he argues that there are 17 arguments that the image on the shroud was caused by radiation coming out of the body. And it's probably the most common view today. If that could possibly be Jesus, and he's crucified, and he's dead, what is radiation doing coming out of his dead body? That that would be that would just be to set up the some of the big issues. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, someone asking, can I mean we don't know if that's Jesus? Then it's just it, it is a possibility that is Jesus. But, yeah, I mean it, it's it's possible. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, I would, I would say it's far more than possible. I would say it's likely to maybe some people say, how convinced am I? I would say some low level of probability, um, 60 to 80 percent. And sometimes I even think it's 90. And they'll say, well, why do you switch back and forth? And I'll say, because it depends on what side of the bed I got up in the morning. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just, you just have different views on different days as you read more data, but the shroud is quite evidential of something, and you have to decide what it is. In fact, a good friend of mine who was on the shroud team, his name is Barry Schwartz. He's uh, Jewish, and he's a non-Christian, and he thinks the shroud is authentic. It buried Jesus. Jesus is crucified. He's dead. This, these are Barry's views. Now, Barry doesn't like radiation, probably because radiation would insinuate a resurrection. Barry thinks you can get there some other way, but he will freely say some other way in the image. But Barry will freely say it it could be a resurrection. He said, I don't take that view, but it could be. So he's open. But I'm just using him as an example of a uh, one of the most knowledgeable people alive on the shroud. He's a non-believer. And yet he believes everything Christians believe about it, except he tends to think that the image is not caused by radiation. He's going to try to go in a different direction there. Mm -hmm, let, me, mm -hmm. let, me ask, let me ask something on that. One of the, the arguments against the shroud that I've heard a couple of times is that um, the dating. Have, what, have, what have you found on the dating of the material? Because some people claim that it's newer dating uh, is not 2,000 years old. Right. Well, there are multiple issues with dating and probably what a lot of people don't realize is that other dating. Okay. The, the dating was done in 1988 and uh, the results came out a couple years later. Since that time, several other dates by frankly, less, by methods that are not as good as carbon-14, but they're still dating methods. And 
one part of the shroud was dated earlier than 88 by the more rigorous method. And at all the other dates, the shroud is first century plus or minus years. Now, it might be a big gap. It might be plus or minus 500 years. But in one of them, it was plus or minus 30 years. So that one medieval date seems to be the standout against all the other ones. And someone says, well, that's because you're using faith or something. No, every one of these were scientific tests of one sort or another. So that's that's uh, one issue. Then there was a famous article written on the date of the shroud, published about uh, maybe 10 years ago. And the author was the chief chemist on the team of uh, scientists. And I don't know if he'd call himself a believer. I'd be surprised if he did. But he starts out his article by saying, don't give me any miracle garbage. I mean, he's really strong. His language is really strong. And he says, don't give me any miracle garbage. I don't want to talk about the shroud being a miracle. He says, but I'll tell you one thing. They dated the wrong thing in 1988. And what he argues is they used all, all three patches that were dated came from the same piece. And he argues that, unfortunately, they took the piece from a portion of the shroud that is the most contaminated. And besides being the most contaminated, well, I'll just make a long story short. His argument is they took the piece of the shroud from an area where there was a patch. Now, you say, well, anybody would be stupid to take a piece of the shroud and take the patch off. But there's two different kinds of patches. One is the kind that when the, the little boy doesn't take off his church clothes when he gets home from church and goes immediately to play baseball and slides into second pay, base and rip his pants, mom can iron on a piece of um, a patch, but then they're, they're going to become play patch. They're no longer church pants. Or if this, the thing is small enough, mom could take a, a needle and try to pick thread that matches the pants and tries to sew just that little bit so he can still wear the pants to church. Okay, both those kind of patches are on the shroud. You've got the you've got the um, uh, patch kind, but you've also got what they call an invisible weave, the, the, trying to match the thread. And Ray Rogers, the guy that wrote the article, said they took a part of the shroud that not only is the dirtiest corner, but it has one of these little invisible weaves in it. And he argued that the patch they took was about, um, I think the number he argued was 60% medieval, sorry, 60% authentic and 40% medieval. And that that 40% medieval skewed the dating on the cloth. So that argument's out there. There's another argument out there from John Jackson, who's maybe the largest, the biggest shroud expert of all of them. And he argues we're never going to get a good date early or late because the shroud's been involved in two fires and fires, fire changes the carbon content. So you've got the carbon argument, you've got the patch argument, and you've got maybe the more impressive argument that there are three or four other dating tests that all disagree with the one you're talking about. So I mean, that's how they come back. That's how they would answer the dating thing. It, let's put it this way. If all a naturalist has is the dating argument, and they're going to put all our eggs in one basket, I think that makes them pretty vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> there was or there is a group, but I think is 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 very silent, you know, now with uh, Marcus Borg and and uh, John Dominic Crossan, and right. I'm talking about the Jesus Seminar, and they came up with this thing of this translation of, of the uh, Gospels and some other things. And right. the so-called red letters of Jesus, they disagree with those. And they would say that probably 90% of what you find in there, or probably even more, is not authentic. Jesus didn't say those things. What is your take on the Jesus Seminar? Okay, now when you say 90%, are you saying the 90% of the red letter words that they... Uh, they, they uh, reject they reject yeah yeah they reject depending on the colors 
red means it's authentic. Mm -hmm. pink, pink means it's probably authentic. Gray means it's probably inauthentic. And black means it's inauthentic. Yeah. Yeah. They judge that 80 to 90% of the so-called red letter words of Jesus are, depending on what percent, depending on whether you're talking about pink or red, Jesus never said them. So, okay. But this might surprise you. That's their sayings book. What did Jesus say? They came out with another book called What Did Jesus Do? And in What Did Jesus Do? They're judging the likelihood of his acts and his actions. And they didn't just do the Gospels. They put a few other key texts in there, like 1 Corinthians 15, the list of appearances. And you might be surprised, but the list, they don't believe in the resurrection. But as far as what the basis is in the New Testament, Paul says in 15.8 and in 1 Corinthians 9.1, in both places he said, I've seen the risen Jesus. They color that red. Red is in yes. In the first appearances to Peter, they color that pink. And then they add in a footnote that they have to have the women in there, at least Mary Magdalene, that the women also saw Jesus. So they've got three events, uh, Paul, Peter, and the women. Two of the three are group because Paul had some other people with them who didn't see Jesus but who heard the voice. And the women who were a group. So the Jesus seminar is amazingly positive on on those three, Paul, Peter, and the women. So that's red. So yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're gonna say. They don't believe in the most of them don't believe in the resurrection, but it's not because they reject eighty to ninety percent of the sayings of Jesus. They think that the appearances look pretty good. Another fellow who's in that category, he's not a Jesus seminar member to my knowledge, but his name is Helmut Kirster, a disciple of uh, a student of Rudolf Boltmann's. Kirster specifically says in his two-volume uh, history of the New Te I mean, introduction to the New Testament, he says the closer we get to the appearances, the more historical they look. And he, he says we can be pretty sure about James um, I think he says James, Peter, of course he's going to allow Paul, and the women. So his list is almost the same with the Jesus Seminar, and he's very critical. So even critics, that's why the critics allow those six facts, the first six facts, one of which is the earliest followers of Jesus thought they saw the risen Jesus. So they're going to grant that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, something we see a lot online is a lot of people saying that, well, uh, Jesus probably never existed. And even, uh, I believe, Richard Dawkins in uh, his book, The Gap Delusion, he even referenced a scholar saying that Jesus, you know, to, to prove that, you know, some scholars believe that Jesus never existed. Right. Can you please tell us about that? Because I think... And I, I mean, now that I think, I know that I would say probably 100%, at least uh, of what I've read, when it comes to scholarship, everybody agrees on that. Okay, Here, here's the difference, and here's why there's the disagreement. Those who say Jesus never lived, including Dawkins, with except for two scholars, except for two scholars, all the rest of them who say that, are out of their field. Richard Dawkins is a biologist. He has no credentials to talk about New Testament theology or philosophy or classics or archeology, span no credentials. And those guys can't stand Christianity to be true. So they got some emotional reasons to go off on this. But Bart Ehrman, who's the best known skeptic today, better known than Don Cross and better known than Marcus Borg who passed away a few years ago. But um, Bart Ehrman has a book called Did Jesus Exist? And, it's, and he's an atheist New Testament scholar, and he goes after these guys you're talking about. He writes the whole book to the group that they call themselves the Jesus Mythers, and he goes after them. And he says at the beginning of the book, he says, to my knowledge of the thousands of scholars in the right field who teach, who, who are, let's say they're trained in, if you want a list, they're trained in Old Testament or New Testament or religion or theology or archaeology or history or the classics. People who have terminal degrees in 
relevant fields and they have a university college or seminary teaching position. He said there is not one among them who believes that Jesus never lived. Not one, says Bart Ehrman. He says the crowd that doesn't believe it are not in the field with the exception of two guys, but those two guys do not hold any university college or seminary teaching positions. So that's the difference. If you cite the guys without the degrees and without the credentials and without being out of the field, yeah, you're going to hear you're going to hear them say, "Oh, wow, it's almost unanimous. People don't believe God exists." Yeah, unanimous of your buddies, the guys you hang around with and probably go to high school in some of the cases. I mean, a lot of them are really young guys, and <laughs> they call themselves scholars, and and you know they like don't have any. Well, many of them have not even been to college, and those who claim that they're um, that Jesus never lived. They're this group that's a not, not a specialist group. But again, let, let Bart Ehrman say it. Uh, and by the way, when I said they haven't even gone to college, I mean, that's just off the top of my head. I have no, no, no idea. I'm sure there are people who don't believe Jesus existed who've been to college and have college degrees, maybe even graduate degrees, but not in the area, except for two, except for two. And Bart Ehrman says even those two, uh, they don't have university, college, or seminary positions. So the whole range of people who debate uh, Jesus' existence from, you know, teens up to any age you want, they're all across the board. But uh, according to Bart Ehrman, none of them but two have terminal degrees in the area. So, But I think Bart Ehrman is very, it's very important that of the thousands who do have terminal degrees, even if they're atheists, agnostics, a Jewish, um, anybody, they don't, they don't question Jesus' existence. So mm -hmm. I think that's the, it depends on who you're talking about. Now, I, let me ask you, let me just piggyback on that. You mentioned too, I haven't read where Bart Ehrman said that, but I'm really glad you pointed that out because I'm going to use that as a reference. And I know one yep. of them is Richard Carrier, but, but who's the other one? Is it Daniel? Bob is it Price? Price. Robert Price. Bob okay. Price. Now, Bob, Bob's a good friend of mine, actually. And Bob's an ex-evangelical who has two PhDs, so he's eminently well qualified. Richard Carrier has a PhD from an Ivy League school in a relevant area, classics and history. Um, he's eminently qualified. So there's two of all the many, 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 many people who claim Jesus existed. Uh, this is Bar Ehrman now. He says, I only know of two who have credentials. And neither of them have teaching positions. And he suggests, Bart Ehrman suggests, that the reason they don't have teaching positions, of course, the two of them could say, I'm not trying to get one. But Bart could say, the reason they don't have teaching positions in accredited universities, colleges, or seminaries is because they are so far off the beaten track of scholarship. This is Bart Ehrman. They're so far off the beaten track that no one's going to hire them to teach in class that Jesus never lived because that's not the status quo view. Exactly. So. That would be like saying uh, someone who uh, teaches geography, but he believes that the earth is flat. That person is not going to get hired to, to teach. <laughs> I think that's what, I think that's what Bart's going after. Yeah. And to give one of his arguments against these guys, like I said, all the way from, some of them are high school and some of them are 70, 80 years old. I mean, it's a whole spectrum of ages and education. Some of them could have doctor. I'm sure some of them have doctor's degrees, but you have to ask what field do they have doctor's degrees in? And he's going to say just what you said. Uh, that's a good example. No one's going to get hired to teach by, a I, you know, I'm not a geologist, but, or a geographer, but if you, if you think the earth is flat, and you've got a PhD in geography, you're not going to be hired if that's what you're going to teach around the university, most likely. So that's what he's saying. Uh, but they do have two guys who have good credentials, but two out of the terminal degrees uh, in the right area among all their numbers. Now, he does list, in all fairness, Bart Ehrman lists some other guys who are Jesus Mithers who have good credentials, maybe not terminal degrees, but he lists another maybe half dozen that are worth listening to. But the point is, those who have, those who are making scholarly contributions among the mythicists are few compared to the many, many, many who say Jesus never lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So uh, something uh, I, I watched uh, a very long time ago was this debate that you had with James Crossley. It, it was really fascinating that uh, he said something about f when he brought up First Corinthians 15, he said, wow, yeah, that's he said something along the lines that First Corinthians 15, if, you, if you're trying to prove the resurrection, that's one of the key passages. Now, you this say, is are you talking about when I dialogue with James Crossley? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, dialogued for a couple hours, and the topic was, do the minimal facts uh, argue for the historicity of the resurrection? And so the talk show host, the moderator, asked me to what minimal facts I want to use, and I listed six. I don't think I even touched the empty tomb, just six. And then he said, James, what do you think about this? And if that's what you're referring to, yeah, James says he can have all six. I won't argue about him because these yeah. are, he, in fact, he said to the moderator, he said, uh, these are probably the six best established facts in the New Testament or something like that. And then we went on from there because he conceded. That's what the minimal facts are supposed to do. It gets mm -hmm. it's a common I, another name for minimal facts argument might be the lowest common denominator argument. It gets almost everyone's going to be on the same page after those six facts are used. In fact, Richard Carrier said in an essay he published, he said, um, now I have a longer list of 12 from which I take the shorter list of six. And Richard said, I can admit Gary's entire 12, except for the empty tomb. I would mention 11 out of 12. Well, of course, my minimal facts don't include the empty tomb, so I take it that means he would concede. Richard Carey would concede all six. I am guessing from knowing Bob Price, I think Bob would concede all six. And there they are, um, all three of them. James Crossley's an agnostic. Mm -hmm. The other two, I don't know if they would say they're agnostics or atheists, but they're gonna they're all going to be pretty radical. Yeah, but I do know that James Crossley... He is an agnostic when it comes to the empty tomb because uh, he said uh, that he he doesn't know either way whether it happened or not. But my, my point is he was talking about 1 Corinthians 15 as a very key passage. How do we know? Because, again, to, to the average person who doesn't know Greek or anything and reads uh, 1 Corinthians 15, there is a creed, but it doesn't look like a creed because when you read it in English, it just looks like, you know, it looks normal. How do scholars know that there is a creed in there and that is connected to the Jerusalem apostles? Well, the, the creedal material, first of all, Paul says, Paul starts by saying it's not his material. Mm -hmm. Paul specifically says, I gave you what I was given. So he's telling the Corinthians that he passed on to them something that predated him, something that he was given, you know, quote, unquote, back in the day. So plus the, the, the text itself, you have to know Greek really, really well, but the text itself reads like, um, well, a lot of, I'll just put it this way, a lot of the new translations of the New Testament are now starting to put the creedal passages in brackets or like poetic form where it's verse and uh for example the philippians hymn and uh, the christological hymn in philippians 2 the creation hymn in colossians 1 they, they're starting to put those in the translators are putting them in that form you can tell that the the text if you know the languages the text breaks out from the material around it and plus mm -hmm. In, in this case, when Paul says, it's not my material, I gave you what I was given, that he's passing on something from somebody else. So for a number of reasons there, the, the, according to a couple of recent publications, the universal, and no, I shouldn't say that, the consensus New Testament position, the consensus New Testament position among critics is that that material dates from 30 to 35 AD. Even the Jesus Seminar, by the way, the Jesus Seminar, if I'm not mistaken, they definitely voted that it was between 30 and 35, but I think they voted that it was pre-Pauline. 
in the sense that when Paul became a Christian, 32 or 33 AD, that creed was already in existence. The Jesus Seminar says that. So at the very worst, they would date it within the first five years. So if the Jesus Seminar is going to date it in the first five years, if Bart Ehrman is going to date it there, if Cross is going to date it there, if Borg is going to date it there, um, you know, that's pretty compelling information of how early it is. That's a yeah. great question. That that's mm -hmm. a, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to see if we can talk about near death experiences too because I know that Joel uh, had some a lot of interest in that and I know that you have a lot of interest and knowledge in that. So yeah, I'm, I'm but, just yeah. I, 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 I just wanted to finish a few things in there and then we're gonna jump into uh, near death experiences. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say going back to First Corinthians fifteen, right. the beauty that I find in there is that. When it comes to the Gospels, and, you know, some people date the Gospels very, very late, but when it comes to 1 Corinthians 15, I would say that it's so close to Jesus, to, to the time of the death of Jesus. I mean, it's incredible. It, it's, it's, it's so amazing, that piece of evidence that we have. Right. James D.G. Dunn, who's as well-respected as anybody in New Testament today, Dunn says that that early creedal passage in 1 Corinthians 15 um, well, Paul introduces it in verse 3, but he, he says that that passage probably dates from just months after the cross. So since we know the cross is in the spring, since we know crucifixion happened in the spring of the year, that mm -hmm. means if it's, according to Dunn, if it's just months later, he thinks that creed could have been creedalized by the end of the same year Jesus was crucified in. And there are scholars who say that that creed dates from 30 A.D., so it's, wow. ex it's extremely, extremely early and well-respected today by critics. Okay, uh, before we get into NDEs, I, I want to ask you something else. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes when we use the Gospels, to be, uh, let's put it like this, sometimes when, when, when we're actually uh, arguing about certain things, we use the Gospels to actually, you know, point out stuff. But then critics would say, but wait a second, I'm talking about non-educated critics. They would say, you're using the Gospels to prove the Gospels. What would you say to those people? All right, so they're, the, the, just to set this up, the critics who are saying that, who are not trained in one of the relevant fields, mm -hmm. they're basically saying, we're arguing in a circle because we're, we're using a Christian text to show what the Christians claim is true, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's precisely, Joel, what the minimal facts argument is based to get around, because the minimal facts argument says, let's table the discussions of when and where the gospel facts came from. Let's talk about reliability later, um, but if, all, if the critics... If non-Christian, let's say Jewish New Testament professors, if mm -hmm. non-Christian, agnostic, and atheist New Testament professors concede these six facts, they're not going to argue like you're arguing, the guys who are not in the field. They're not going to argue that, oops, Habermas just used a circular argument. They're trying to use the Gospels to prove the history. Um, they're not arguing that way. If they're going to use the six facts, if they're going to admit them, I'll use them to show the resurrection happened. So critics would not argue that way. Um, so I, I narrow the field of the facts, hence the six uh, plus, if you want to say six plus one, uh -huh. six is the empty tomb, um, which again, I'll repeat, empty tomb is not, a mem is not a, one of the minimal facts. Um, if I used only the data, which the non-Christian, heavily skeptical scholars included, but they're going to admit them, then I'm not arguing in a circle, or they won't admit it. So it's it's. I understand where the the non-trained person is saying sounds like you're using your source, but here's the rule: when I did my PhD at Michigan State, the the fellows on my committee said to me, they said you can. They said, don't tell us the resurrection happened because the gospel said so. But I can still use the New Testament, they thought, 
I can still use the New Testament as long as I only use verses in the New Testament that are critically ascertained, that are critically evidenced, that can be established critically. In other words, with my, the guys on my committee, I could use any verse in the New Testament I wanted to if it was backed up by a number of arguments. So, in other words, that removed, even my, the fellows on my committee, half of whom didn't believe in the resurrection, one was a Jewish historian, by the way, on my committee, and he was probably the most helpful and the most positive of everybody on the committee was a Jewish professor of history, a great, great guy and great outlook on the uh, dissertation. Of course, he liked it, so I think he's great. Um, but all of them, th th what they're saying is, yeah, don't use the passages for which you don't have any evidence, because that sounds like what the critics are saying, the, the untrained critics. But you can use any verse that has backup. Of course you can. You could use any verse in the ancient world with backup. So that's exactly what I did with the minimal facts. In fact, I started developing the minimal facts back in my dissertation. And I actually started developing the minimal facts. argument. I, I wrote it in the dissertation, but I actually started working on it. I actually started, <laughs> I have documents that I took notes and started developing it about three years before I wrote my dissertation. So it goes way back. I think I think that's the way to argue against critics who don't think you should use unevidenced text. But, of course, I don't use any unevidenced text. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you now a question that is, is, is going to tie in that into the NDEs as well. So okay. there's something that we have in the Gospels, and I would say that for a lot of things, probably not everything, but for a lot of things, we have eyewitness testimony. But on the other hand, for NDEs, what we have is also, I mean, it's, even though I'm not saying it's the same thing, but we also have eyewitness testimony. So some people would say that eyewitness testimony is unreliable because, you know, uh, is contradictory, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think about eyewitness testimony and, and, and NDEs as well? I'm, I'm trying to connect these two things together. Well, I don't know who's going to say uh, eyewitnesses are unreliable because if they do, we won't have a court system in this country. And courts not only allow firsthand eyewitness data, of course, but courts also allow circumstantial evidence. Um, so I don't, I don't know who you have in mind. I don't know anybody who would say eyewitness testimony is no good, but they can say whatever they want. I'm going to trust people who are actually there on the scene or, uh, you know, and that doesn't mean they're infallible, but that means they're better than any other source you can give me. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're not going to accept eyewitness sources, what are you going to accept? Non eyewitness sources. Now that shows you how prejudiced that objection is. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about NDEs. And, and I, I know that you're saying that, and these doesn't, you know, this doesn't necessarily prove the resurrection. But I would say, and I think you would agree with this, it strengthens the case for the resurrection, even though we have a really strong case. Okay. First of all, you're right. NDEs not only, NDEs don't prove the resurrection at all. But because NDEs are a general religious evidence that argues that naturalism is mistaken and that some religion is true. So a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, and a Christian could all stand shoulder to shoulder and like NDE evidence because NDEs don't tell you which of those four or any other religion um, is true. It doesn't answer the who's true question. But it does say that naturalists are mistaken, and they're the primary worldview in the West today. So uh -huh. NDEs argue that, that naturalism is in trouble. Then, to use my example, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Muslim, and the Christian would have to start comparing notes and to see what other evidences say each of their religions are true to pick a religion. In, uh, the NDEs just say some other realm is true. Now we have to go to completely different evidences to say which view of the afterlife is true. 
Can I, I want to ask a question related to that. Um, so I'm just wondering on, on NDEs, have you had some of the NDEs that I've read about? Like, for example, I read Betty Eadie's book, Embraced by the Light, where she actually found herself in heaven. I read another book with that little boy, Todd Burpo. Um, it was, uh, I forgot what it was called right now. Um, heaven is for real. Right. And I read these books and they talk about heaven. Um, right. What have you have you read anything from Muslims or or people from different faiths that that have their own version of heaven or something like that in their near death experience? Well, actually, I, I have read surveys with people of other religions who have had NDEs, and probably the most impressive one I read. It weren't exactly NDEs, but they were like near death phenomena related phenomena, and there were over six hundred cases of Hindus. Who had these these uh, uh, experiences, and each one basically what they say is they see a religious person. If they see a person at all, they see a religious person from their own tradition. So, a Hindu might see Shiva. Um, a Jewish individual often reports seeing angels um, because they don't believe they're going to see God, right? Because God, you know. You can't see God. So they say angels. Um, and Christians would say they see Jesus. But I think the whole bunch of Shiva, angels, Christians, I don't think we can tell any of them are true. Because here's my, here's another one. I mean, what about atheists who go to heaven? Are they, they say they do. And they say, hey, I must be a pretty good guy because they told me it's not my time yet, but I'm going to come back here someday and see, I don't have to convert to Christianity because I'm a good guy. Or, you know, anybody can say that. But here's the problem. When I do NDEs, I'm only interested in evidential claims. There are over 300 evidential claims today in the literature, over 300 NDEs with evidence, some little evidence, some a lot of evidence, but over 300. And the evidence is this worldly. The evidence is, um, oh, here's an actual case. A woman who, uh, it might've been a man who was up above his body during surgery and who looked over in the next surgical ward through the wall and saw a man having his leg amputated uh, and described the leg being amputated. Now that's in a book called The Self Does Not Die. Um, and that book has over a hundred of these evidential cases. So the, the ones that have evidence are evidence from this world because we have to check it out. But the kind of evidence is like, I'm a Buddhist and I went to heaven. I'm a Muslim and I went to heaven. I'm a Christian and I went to heaven. I saw angels or even the 20-ish percent cases that went to hell. All of those are in the next, are in a non, non-evidential non realm, almost without exception. They're in a non-evidential realm. And the way I set it up is I'm only going to deal with, ed with evidential cases. I want evidence, so why talk about them? If you're going to tell me your testimony that you're an atheist and you come back in 20 years and you're going to go to heaven. There's no evidence for that. There's no evidence that anybody saw anything. And you said, well, are you just as critical of Christians who say they say Jesus? I am. I am just as critical of Christians. Well, how about are you just as critical of people who say they went to hell? That supports your worldview. I am just as critical of as people who say they saw, um, you know, they went to hell or saw hell. Uh, there's no evidence for those things. So you can listen to the stories. You can see what you want. You can be scared. You can be blessed. You can think what you want to from the stories. But if you only use the evidenced ones, we don't have any reason to think any of the, which religion is true from the Indies alone. Because they all this is a testimony. If I'm not bothered by a guy walking up to me at work and saying, I'm a Buddhist, why should I be upset with an indie ear saying I'm a Buddhist and they told me I'm fine? Those are they're both testimonies without evidence. So I can only use the evidential ones. And so we're talking about things in this world. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, there are so many. I'm talking about documented cases. Yes. And uh, I know there is a guy. Uh, he's a, a an MD doctor. Uh, his name is, I believe he's an MD doctor. His name is uh, Michael Savon. Yep, I know Mike very well. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. And I forgot, and we were talking about this, that there's a book from University of Missouri, and they, they were referencing, you know, like millions of cases that have happened, not only here in America, but also in, in, right. in other continents and, and so on and so right. forth. Can you please elaborate on that? What do you want me to elaborate on in particular? I mean, yeah, they're all over the world. They're in every culture. They're in first world countries, second world countries, third world countries, and they're today, they're in the 1700s. Uh, Plato, Plato has a near-death experience, you know, 600-ish uh, years B.C. Uh, many people think, even some of the old commentaries before NDEs were popular, people think there are NDEs in the New Testament. So, <laughs> in other words, there are NDEs in every culture, every part of the world, and way before the present century. Okay, uh, but what I'm seeing is, and let me reference this, you said in one, one of your conferences, uh, you said that naturalism was on its way out, and you referenced a professor from England that actually saw an angel. That The professor from England actually what? Saw an angel. Oh, yeah. I know, and I know of an atheist professor in this country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who said he saw an angel, an atheist. So, yeah, you can get those. Now, now yeah. see, that's this worldly. If you saw an angel in your backyard last week, you can presumably, at least theoretically, check that out because it's in your backyard. But when somebody says they saw an angel up in heaven, I don't have any photographic or EEG or EKG no material to back that up. I think there are angel cases on Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, books have been written about them. But yeah, but, uh, yeah I wanted to on. I wanted to ask on on Professor Gary, Gary Habermas if uh, have you had any backlash from um, the NDE idea? Because I know in some churches they they sort of look down on the idea of NDEs. In fact, even in my own church, they. They don't tend to talk about NDEs and they sort of, um, they don't want us talking about them. They're afraid that someone will go out and try to game the system and make up their own NDE and then try to make money off it. So no. um, have you had any of that? Well, not too much, but, but there's some reason for that because some of the one or more of the published NDE counts turned out later to be fraud. And the person who, if I remember the story, the person who, wrote the story said that it was made up so they that could that they might fear that and i also think that a lot of christian churches would the exact same thing i just mentioned i would think that a lot of the christian churches would be very nervous if a buddhist comes back and says they 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 sent me back and said, it's not my time. But they said, later, I'll be able to come there and go to heaven. That's going to bother a lot of people. But like I said, it doesn't count for anything. It's simply a testimony. It's an unevidenced testimony. There's no evidence that they were in heaven, no evidence that they were told they were going to stay in heaven. But I would be just as hard on Christians who say, mm -hmm. I must be okay because I was told I'm going to come back and go to heaven. I, I can say I can be just as polite for the Buddhist as I can be for the Christian. I can be just as polite, but I don't accept either story as being well evidenced. I can't yeah. accept it because there's there's no data that they were there. So basically, they're giving me a testimony. What do you do when you hear testimonies? You listen, you listen patiently and politely and just say, huh, well, thank you for sharing that. But that doesn't mean I believe the testimony and I'm not inclined to believe the Buddhist. Wow, I'm prejudiced. No because I don't believe the Christian who gives the exact same testimony. Okay, but there are some real, I'm not talking about those kind of cases of people going to hell, going to heaven. I'm talking about the real cases that we have. And in your interview with Dr. Frank Turek, I believe, 
you were talking about this girl that was able to uh, uh, like write write a number or something like that. Yeah. 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 I get, can you please talk to us about those kind of cases? You know, cases that we can actually verify. Well, those are really something because the person who reported the twelve-digit number it was up mm -hmm. in the air above everybody's head, and she saw the twelve-digit number because she said she was up above her body, and you could say, "Yeah, right. You don't have any evidence for that." And she said, "Ah, uh, yes, I do because I memorized the twelve-digit number." And when she came to, she gave the number to two of the nurses in the room. They copied it down. And then they had a guy get up in the air and check the number. He had to climb up on a little ladder or something, a stool or something. He had to get up on it to see. And the number was exactly what she reported. You, you know what makes this incredible is that my teaching assistant, my TA, is a PhD candidate. and I don't know how to do this kind of stuff. I'm not good on a computer, but he's got magic fingers like this generation does. And he emailed the nurse who copied the 12 digit number down. He emailed her and she gives an extraordinary account. The same that's in the book. The self does not die. She tells the same story. And she said, I was really skeptical until I wrote the number down. And then we sent somebody up there to check the number. And it was the same number. The gal said she saw And she said that totally changed my life on this on this topic regarding this topic. So, yeah, there is another criticism is that they're anecdotal. Uh, well, a lot of the NDEs are reported from 15 years ago, 10 years ago, eight years ago. But some of them, like this nurse, they're they are they are told on the spot when the person is resuscitated. So they're not anecdotal in that sense at all. Mm -hmm. well, okay. That's yeah. Uh, carry on. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I think that that's really interesting stuff. And I, I can say that my mom even felt like she had her own near death experience when, um, when I was, when she was giving birth to me in the hospital. So my mom was actually outside of her body watching people work with me uh, in that birthing process, which is pretty amazing. So I am inclined to believe my mom, but I know that she, others she, won't. Okay. Since she was watching you being prepped or whatever the nurses were doing, did she report anything that could be verified? I, you know, I don't think she did. And it was unfortunately so many years ago. Right. That, um, it's But I mean, some people would might say something like, um, boy, I was scared to death because my daughter stopped breathing for a moment and the nurse reached inside her mouth and took out a bunch of mucus and gave her a little pop. And then she started breathing. And boy, did I breathe a sigh of relief as I looked up, as I was up above and I saw it. And then you go back and look at the reports and it says, the newborn gagged and the nurse put her finger in the baby's mouth and pulled out this mucus. That, that, that's how the, that's how the uh, evidential cases read. So she sees something, one of them, I mean, there's a bunch of them. One of them um, that a student told me one time was that the nurse, the, the, her, his mother was up above her body and she saw the nurse break a beaker or something but it was like out in the hallway, outside the operating room. And when she came to, she said, um, they broke a, a beaker out there and they were able to interview the nurse to see if she indeed had dropped a beaker on the ground and cleaned it up. So, and, and that's out in the hallway. So someone doesn't uh -huh. even, can't even say, well, sometimes our ears are operating during surgery. Actually, that's not true. If you have, if you have, there are people who can hear things during surgery, but the way I understand it is, light surgery, not general surgery. And general surgery, you can't. But there's one more thing. Uh, dozens of these uh, NDE evidences, they're either during general surgery or when, as far as can be determined by the machines, there's no heart or brain activity. And if you can give evidence of the beaker dropping out of the hallway or what your relatives are saying four floors away in the waiting room, Uh, and you can say what they said, and the people can verify it, but you did not have any measurable brain or heart waves, that's extremely influential of human consciousness uh, extending beyond the measurable part of uh, brain death. So they can be highly evidential. And what yeah, would you say... 
yeah uh before we go to the audience uh what would you say to the person who would say well you know i i believe that, i mean i i'm a naturalist and i don't believe that in the, in these kinds of experiences um what would be like the best evidence to convince someone like that when it comes to well, NDEs? first of all i would ask do you not believe it because you're a naturalist and you don't want to believe it because if you oh no no it's not because of that i just don't believe these things well then why don't you refute the case why don't you tell me how the woman knew the beaker was broken out in the hall how does the woman know what the relative said five floors away in the in the waiting room and there's way more incredible ones in that uh you know how do you know how the guys had his leg cut off in the next room over um how do you know those things a person could say i don't like those but i i would tend to think the i don't like those account is because you don't believe them in the first place it's because of your worldview uh, not because of what you do with the evidence. Right now, from what we can tell from interviews and polls and so on, uh, evidential near-death experiences are having a lot of effect on the American public, telling them that there's an afterlife. Unfortunately, they're probably buying the religious cases hook, line, and sinker too, and saying, oh yeah, but I know this Buddhist, and he was told he was coming back to heaven. Unfortunately, they're citing those cases too, I imagine, because they're not telling the difference between evidential cases and non-evidential cases. Mm -hmm. I want to let yeah, Stephanie I like that you uh, take over. That. I think I think that's good. You distinguish that. Can you now? You've written some books on this. Can you um, share with us the the books that you've written on this, and um, and also any other new, forthcoming books? Uh, one of the persons in the audience asked if you had any books on their way out or about to about to be released. Is only a resurrection. On the resurrection, I've written twenty something books on your death, and and if, if that's what they're asking, uh, just a couple would be the case for the resurrection of Jesus, co-authored with Mike Lacona, um, a book called uh, "The Risen Jesus and Future Hope." There you go. There's that one, mm -hmm. and another one is called "The Risen Jesus and Future Hope." Um, I've got two books on the Shroud of Turin, co-authored with uh, Ken Stevenson. Another book called um the historical jesus which has a lot of evidence if you mean near-death experiences i have not written a whole book on indies but i've written two long detailed chapters on indies in a book called beyond death and i've written a long chapter with a lot of evidence in a book that was just published by uh wiley blackwell a secular publisher in oxford england and um, it is on, it's a pretty technical book, but it's, uh, I think it's called the, the, the uh, Blackwell, uh, it's the, you know what, I'll get the exact title right here. If you hold on one second, I'll get it. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, great. <laughs> and then we can probably uh, get here some questions right, from the audience. Here it is right here. The <laughs> Blackwell Companion to Substance Dualism. It's very heavy philosophical book, but I do have a detailed chapter in here published by Blackwell on uh, evidential NDs only. So I, so I have at least three, well, I have more than three. I maybe have six or eight chapters on the, on NDs and articles, a lot of articles, but not, not a whole book on NDs. That's great. I, I wanted to also ask, I, I just wanted to quick mention one of my friends on uh, social media, his name is Josh Brister. And he says that he knows you. So he wanted me to do a shout out to you. And I, yeah. I don't know. If you're well, tell, tell Josh, hi, I do indeed know Josh. And he was here many years ago here at Liberty. And uh, last time I heard, I think he was in Texas. Is he still, is he, can you tell if he's still from Texas there? Yeah, I think that is where he is. So uh, yeah, I, but I could tell you, yep. I've known Josh for a long time, probably maybe getting close to 20 years. Wow. Certainly for 10 or 15. That's significant. Um, Joel, did you have any other? I, I'm going to look in the audience and see if I see some questions in here while. while uh, oh, yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm seeing that many people want, want to ask uh, questions. So, yeah, I, I was just going to say that this is a very interesting topic, uh, NDEs. I hadn't paid a lot of attention to it because... In the past, I saw so many cases of people going to hell, going to heaven. And then uh, if I saw someone, like you said, from another religion, they had something like that. 
And I was like, I'm not going to bother with this because it, it, it looks like very, very biased. But then I saw some studies, you know, that you referenced. I'm talking about these real cases. I can actually, we can actually verify in the sense that someone who, like that girl who gave the uh, data, uh, you know, those numbers, but people didn't know that. And then on the other, I mean, we can actually cross that and say, oh, look, they coincide. And we can actually know that it's true. Right. So I, that, that, that's the kind of case I'm really interested in. I, I'm just right. like you. I'm, I'm data driven. I'm well, not interested another, in. Another patient actually found a quarter up in the rafters where someone flipped. You know, we're always trying to shoot things up in the air on cross beams and things. And there was a quarter up there. And the person reported the data on the quarter. Now, it's true that most quarters would be today would be 1980, let's say, to 2019. But that's still a wide range of numbers, and a, it's very improbable that somebody could hit the date exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, a, there's just a number. There's just a number of good evidences that what we're reporting um, is actually evidence and actually true. Again, it doesn't show what your religion is true, but it shows that some kind of religious view, an other world, I call this the uh, the Oz objection, the Wizard of Oz objection, or the Narnia objection, or the Middle Earth objection, because it basically NDEs tell you there's another world. Yeah, and I've seen cases in which people uh, have experienced NDEs, but they say, you know, they would say, well, I didn't experience anything in, in the sense that I didn't go to heaven or I didn't see the light. And it's, I mean, it's so incredible because these cases always differ from one another. Well, true. But you know what? Michael Sabom, who to whom you referred earlier, in his earlier book called Recollections of Death, uh, which is still said to be one of the most scientific books on the subject, Mike has charts in the back of people who have NDEs. And some of them, he's a cardiologist. So some of them, they have multiple near-death episodes because their heart keeps, you know, going in and out over the years. And some of them have no experience at all. And and I'm just making this up. But maybe somebody has, I mean, I'm making up how many and what, but maybe somebody had five near-death episodes, had two NDEs, and three times they saw nothing. So if somebody, if somebody says, I, strangely enough, I just got a call on this this morning where somebody said, um, this this person had an NDE and had no recollection. I said, well, hey, look, that's really common. It's really, really common, but it doesn't mean you won't have one the next time. Just check, take a look at Mike Sabom's list in his book. So, Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. So, I want to add a, another question from the audience. I, I see uh, Pine Creek Doug. He comes in here every once in a while and asks questions, and he uh, he's wondering about the minimal facts. Uh, right. Going back to that for a second. And he said, is there a second best explanation? So the first best explanation of the minimal facts is the resurrection. Uh, he said, is there a second one? You mean like a natural explanation? Is there any other explanation that can take all of those facts and account for them? Well, I suppose somebody could come up with a natural theory and especially craft it to apply to all six of them. But now the problem is going to be, let's put resurrection versus this unnamed, this is what we do all the time with naturalistic theories. Let's put the resurrection next to this suggested naturalistic theory and see which one has more data and can one be refuted and one not be refuted. But let's just say for the sake of the argument that the, uh, you know, it's going to be some kind of natural theory that claims to account for all six. And I'll say, well, here's 10 refutations of that natural theory. How many refutations do you have that this is the resurrection? And they're just really hard pressed to explain that. I, let's put it this way. Whether you can ac ac account for something that can explain all of them or not, the question is going to be, the best question in that case is going to be, which one accounts better for the facts we know and agree to? That's good. That's good. Thank you, Excellent. Joel. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you want if you want to take another question from the audience, 
There, there was another question, and I'm not familiar with this, but have you heard of Alvin Plantinka's um, uh, epistemic objection to the resurrection? It's my understanding he's a Christian, so I wouldn't see him having an object in, objection, but I, yeah. but I could be off on that. Yeah, Alvin Plantinka is a very committed Christian and does not have an objection to the resurrection. He has, they might be, uh, you know what, I hate to mention it because it's a really technical argument, and then I would have to give the technical comebacks that everyone's going to say, wow, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, he does offer a caution about how the evidence is used, but as far as against the resurrection, no, as a matter of fact, a good friend of mine right here in my philosophy department got a letter from Alvin Plantinga, and, and Al said, I love Gary's evidences for the, I love, love the way he does evidences. And I suppose that means the minimal facts. So not only would Al think there's any problems, he told, he told this mutual friend of ours that he liked the way I argued. So I don't think I, I could mention the other thing, what it is, but I think it's going to lose everybody in the audience. So, but it doesn't go after the resurrection per se. He doesn't, he, there's no way he would go after the resurrection. Yeah. Matter of fact, he's got a book where a friend of his in the book, writes a pro resurrection article in the book that Al edited. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, j just just another question on the resurrection because there's some Christians, I'm talking about like on, on the really liberal fringe of, of Christianity, they would they would actually argue that the resurrection of Jesus did happen, but it was not bodily resurrection. It was just some kind yeah. of Numa, some kind of you know sure. uh, spirit or something like that. Sure. How can how can we actually know that it was it was bodily resurrection? Okay, first thing I would say is, if they're going to admit a real resurrection in less than a real physical body, but they're going to admit a real resurrection, and some people take that path. The first thing I note is, I don't like that view, but let's just note the resurrection is still true on that theory. That's the first thing I note. They still believe in the resurrection. Okay, but if I'm going to argue, how do I know it's bodily in nature? Uh, I could say a lot of things. This first point doesn't prove it's bodily, but just in, if this interests people, the majority of critical scholars today, the majority of the field thinks that the disciples thought, whatever they think, they think that the disciples thought that they were bodily appearances. So I think that's very important. And I think what you do is you go in at each of the counts and look at what the texts say. And I think it's I think the reason people concede that John, Luke, Matthew, Paul believed in bodily appearances is because that's what the texts say. That's what their texts state. Even Paul. And that is the majority view today. So, uh, you know, they can hold that view, but they're holding it against the New Testament evidence and even the evidential portions of the New Testament. But I would be pleased that at least they were affirming the resurrection. That's not a deny the resurrection theory. That's a deny the historical, the physical nature of the resurrection. But they still believe Jesus was raised from the dead the way you described it. Mm hmm Okay. And it's it's not uncommon. People do take that. And most of all, I'm glad they believe in the resurrection. But then I'd have to take great difference with them on how we know it's bodily, the appearances. Mm -hmm. That's great. We probably have time for maybe one more question. Do you think that to, to give uh, Dr. Hammond the rest of the afternoon off? <laughs> <laughs> you have any more from the, from the listeners or not? Yeah. Let me look at the, let me just look over here. Uh, okay, there's one more from uh, Pine Creek. It says, would you say Jesus can be found in the stories of Moses and Elisha? Uh, if so, could authors of the Gospels use the Old Testament to create narratives? Okay, first part of that is, what could the, what's the part Do you about think Moses? that, would you say that Jesus can be found in the stories of Moses and Elisha? And then if so, could the authors of the Gospels use the Old Testament to basically... It seems create to narratives. Me, I could be wrong, but I think what the question sounds like is being asked is, could a New Testament writer get inspiration from an Old Testament account? And that's their idea. The Old Testament is their idea for teaching the resurrection. 
Okay, if that's the question, the issue is going to be, what do you do with those who claim, eyewitnesses who claim that they saw risen appearances of Jesus? And in that case, it's irrelevant where they got the idea. It, no, I don't think you can, to answer the first part of the question, no, I don't think we can say that some Old Testament stories would be responsible for the New Testament teaching. But even if there was, even if the critics said, well, I think there's some there. Well, great. But, the, but that does not explain. The New Testament teachings are not based on what they found from the Old Testament or other religions. The, old, the New Testament teachings are based on people. They didn't say, hey, you know, I was thinking about this, and I think Jesus was really raised. They're saying, I saw Jesus. And by the way, for people who respond that way, those are what I ask my grad students all the time. I'll say, is this theory an empty tomb theory or a closed tomb theory? Those are close. That's a those are closed tomb theories because there should have been a body in the tomb. But the, there's over 20 evidences, literally over 20 evidences that the tomb was empty. You go, well, that's not one of your minimal facts. No, it's not. But that's irrelevant. There's still over 20 facts for the empty tomb. If the, if that view is true, empty tomb is really really difficult. Uh, how? Why was Paul converted on that theory? Paul knew the Old Testament. Why wasn't he a Christian? So why wasn't he converted? James. James knew the Old Testament, but James was an unbeliever. And he thought his brother actually the Greek. And Mark 3, he thought Jesus was out of his mind. So that's a pretty strong critic. Why would James be convinced? Because he knew the Old Testament. So why? But the main thing is, these guys didn't say, I got this idea. They said... I saw him alive. So you have to you have to come up with something that uh, explains what they were seeing, and that's why that early creed in First Corinthians fifteen that has three appearances to individuals. Uh, if you add Paul at the end, which Paul adds his name, and three appearances to groups, the uh, the twelve, all the apostles, and the five hundred, that makes these kind of theories. That's the earliest one. The earliest list is the longest list, and it has three appearances to groups, which is very, very important. So, no, I, it, it's irrelevant where they got the idea. The The point is that no matter where they got the idea, you can't explain it with other theories. Yeah, that, that's actually a great answer, and you gave some ideas that I had never even thought about, like with James mm -hmm. and Paul. So I, I really like that. James and Paul, the empty tomb, that's a knockout. But mm -hmm. the, big, the biggest one Remember, we started the show and you said, what's the best evidence? I said, because the original witnesses thought they saw the risen Jesus. It's the language of sight. They could care less what the Old Testament teaches. They could even care less about what Buddhism teaches or other religions. They're interested in what they saw. And some of them were skeptics until they saw Jesus. So it's the appearances that changed them, not the existence of some other story, some other place and time. Exactly. Very good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> very, very good. So for the people who want to interact with you, they want to know about uh, you and, you know, do you have social media, a website or something like that? Unfortunately, I don't do social media for this reason. <laughs> I don't because I would I would never get out of it. I am right now writing my magnum opus on the resurrection. In wow. It now stands at 4,400 pages. Oh, wow. my gosh. I have about 400 more pages to write. So do you guys know Craig Keener, the name? Craig Keener? Yes. Mm -hmm. Craig Keener called me about three weeks ago, and he goes, how are you coming on your magnum opus? And I said, well, I'm at page 4,400. I probably have about 400 pages to go. And you guys wow. are going to laugh out of this. I said to Craig, I said, Craig, your commentary on Acts is 5,000 pages long. My goal in my magnum opus is to beat your Acts commentary by one page. <laughs> so I want, and that's exactly what he did, Joel. That's exactly what he did. He started laughing and he said, go for it, Gary, go for it, get 5,001. So anyway, wow. what I'm saying, I could never finish this book if I'm responding. People do still find my email and they still write to me. And I, like I said earlier, I get probably three or four doubter uh, emails a week. So they do write to me. But if I just opened myself up and said, I, I spend three hours a day on email right now. 
three hours a day. I would never finish that magnum opus if I had to answer everything that comes in. So I'm sorry. They can go to my website, but there's no there's no email address there. So they could go to GaryHabermas.com. The good news is nothing is for sale there. So that's not my way of getting them to buy something. I don't have anything for sale. But they can see a lot of lectures, video, audio on the resurrection, on your death experiences, how to deal with doubt. They can answer their own questions by going to the site or by going to my hundreds, I think hundreds, I've been told, of YouTube videos and look. So I'd say if they want to know, go to YouTube or go to my website. And uh, But I try to steer away from the emails or I won't get my work done. I'm and sorry. when <laughs> – no, that's fine. And when is your book going to come out, if you can tell us? I've been working on it for five years already, and the research uh, is all done. It's taken me five years just to get the pages together. I probably won't be done writing for a year or two, and then I've got to edit all 5,000 pages before I send it. And then all those pages have to be edited a second time when the editor gets a hold of them. So I'm sorry, but, I mean, it, it could be three, four, five years before the first volume comes out. But it's probably going to be multi-volumes. Mm -hmm. That's, okay. you know, that's really amazing because I'm looking at my Bible in front of me. I just looked at my Bible. It has 1,940 pages. So you're, you're going to have more pages on the resurrection than the Bible has. And I'm even wow. looking at this this massive book that I have right here um, from a... Uh, it's either Tom Green, Ryder. McKnight and, oh, and uh, Marshall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got this massive book that's about 900 pages. So you're, you're really uh, putting uh, out a... This is going to be a very fat book. I passed 900 a long time ago. No, there's no way they can put 5,000 pages in one book. So I have no idea. It might be three volumes, might be four volumes. I don't know. I'm not even looking for a publisher right now. I'm just trying as hard as I can to get the book written. Okay. That is amazing. Well, well, listen, I really appreciate that you took the time today to come on and, and share so much of your knowledge with our viewers. And and Joel and I had a had a great time. Uh, as soon as we heard that you would be willing to do this, we got I got really excited. I started tweeting about it and making sure that everyone knew. So um, so I, I want to thank you. And I for viewers, I hope you'll like and subscribe to the channel and uh, and come back again. And uh, and would you both like to make a couple of closing remarks? Um, well, yeah, go uh, ahead. Okay, yeah, I was just going to say really quick that um, uh, I really, really appreciate Dr. Gary Habermas because a very long time ago, this is really quick, um, <clears throat> when I went to university, uh, I, I was doing New Testament, and when I was going through the Pauline uh, letters, I came across this book that I had to read, and it was from uh, Gerd Luderman. And it really, really uh, hit me really hard because he was actually addressing the resurrection point by point by point and how it probably didn't happen. And I'm like, oh, wow, but this is the key thing. And, the, and, and then someone told me, man, you got to listen to this. And I, and, and I think it was 2007, 2008. I listened to this debate that you had in, in uh, Cambridge, I believe. And it, it was amazing. And then I, I came across uh, Dr. Lytona and, and, and Will Lane Craig. So to me, you are one of my heroes, I would say. <laughs> thank you so much for all the work you have done. Well, thank you very much, Joel. Joel, who, what, what debate did you say you came across? It was one that you had with, uh, I forgot his name. It, it was in London. Um, was it a oh written debate or an oral debate? No, no, it, it was oral presentation. It, it is still on YouTube. Really okay. good debate with, I uh, forgot his name. Uh, Kenneth, uh, I, Kenneth something. Ken, I forgot his name. Huh. Uh, but okay. it, it, was, it, was, it was an amazing debate, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think all I would say in, in sum is I'll make kind of a startling statement that I think is, is uh, true. And that is, I tell my grad students all the time, if all we know about everything in the Old and New Testament, if all we know is true, is that Jesus is Son of God who died on the cross for our sins, who was raised from the dead. If that's all we know, he, he's the Son of God, died on the cross of deity, death, resurrection. If that's all he is, Christianity is true. And you say, whoa. Oh, no, wait a minute. What about sovereignty, free will? How about the age of the earth? 
what's happening in the last days? And I'm saying, you know, you're not listening. As long as we know Jesus is Son of God, died on the cross, was raised from the dead, Christianity is true. And I will add a cute little reference. You can be on the yellow brick road going to the Emerald City uh, and just know those three things. Deity, death, resurrection. And the evidence that all these other views are out there, but we don't have to. The majority of, of beliefs, Christians have different views. That's why two or three different publishers have as many as 50, five, zero, three, four, and five views books. We know there are three, four, and five views on a whole lot of topics. But again, as long as the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus are true, heaven is offered, there's a path, and they can get on the yellow brick road and head toward the Emerald City, um, to use the Oz illustration. Or they can visit Narnia. You know, I often think about 30 million people. We started the show, 30 million people who had near-death experiences or similar uh, phenomena, according to their testimony, that's like saying a good deal of those people claim to visit Narnia. They claim to visit another world. So if that's all, that's how I would end. If that's all we can know is that deity, death, resurrection are true, we have enough to start a pilgrimage toward heaven. And uh, I would leave it right there. I think that's wonderful. And that's almost just saying, go read your Bible, pull out John 3, 16. There's one verse. If this is the only <laughs> verse that you read, uh, that's all you need to know. And, and I think that, uh, you know, coming, Joel and I both, or Jill watched my uh, debate that I, I hosted a couple of days ago between a young earth creationist and an old earth creationist. And I think that speaks to the idea that there are all these views, but we all did come to the agreement in the middle of the debate. Yes, but guess what? We all agree on the resurrection. So. And they all agree on creation, too, no matter what your view on the time of creation is. Yeah. Yeah. Were there, I mean, some, were there some hot moments in the debate? Um, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't as bad. It wasn't too bad. It's uh, Kent Hovind, if you've heard of him and uh, and Joel Edmund Anderson. So these were the two who were, who uh -huh. were debating. So um, but they were it was interesting. I, I don't I don't think. What do you think, Joel? Would you say there were hot moments? Uh, yeah. In my case, I, I, I try to. I mean, yeah, it, it was it was really good. I, I just try to stay away from those topics because I'm not like really good at science. <laughs> right. But yeah, I really enjoyed uh, 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 the debate, and I'm more into the biblical stuff, New Testament, right. and resurrection, and things like that. Right. They're probably yeah. fun to listen to anyway. It's well, it's always you. entertaining. Well, I want to say thank you again, and we know where to find you, and uh, and and you're at Liberty University. I know that you're. Uh, busy as a chair and a professor of theology and philosophy. So you're obviously very well read. And so I appreciate all of your knowledge today. Thank, Thank you. you too, Joe, for organizing this. Thank you. Okay.